um, your homework assignment. I've, I've noticed that most people have already done that introductory assignment. Last time I checked, uh, yesterday afternoon, the majority of those were already uploaded. I think, did I tell you it would be open till 2 today? So if you haven't got it done yet, it's still open until 2 o'clock, that homework one, the introductory assignment. Your first uh, technical assignment, though, is due on Tuesday, the one related to problem solving and all that. Uh, today I'm going to give you some key ideas to one of the homework problems, and we're going to work a couple of examples that will tie into several of the others. Uh, but you'll need to submit that as a PDF file to MU Online. Uh, I'm going to show you in just a minute how to use this, the CAM scanner app uh, on my phone. I'll give you a demo. You're also welcome to use your own flatbed scanner or there's a copy machine up on the second floor that you can put in a stack of papers, type in your email address, and it'll just suck them through and send you an email of the PDF. Uh, that's in, in the department offices in the conference room area. So um, let me give you that demo on how to use CAM scanner. Basically, earlier today I installed it on my phone. I turn on the cam scanner app and then just uh, there's a very obvious take a picture button you take a picture of uh, whatever you're going to turn into a homework assignment and um, it automatically sends it to the online area and I mean you can uh, if needed you can rotate it and uh, change it from color to black and white in fact you get better results if it's in black and white than in color uh, so this is the one that I just barely took a picture of. You see 1102. So I can click on that and I can look at it. Uh, zoom in on it if I want just to make sure it's nice and clear. And this is actually the low res. It has a separate high resolution, high quality version, but that's turned off right now. This is the low quality version and it still, it looks great. So you click here, download as a PDF and I'll put that in a spot that I'm sure to remember. I'll put it like in a temporary folder or something like that. I'd call that maybe Homework 2A. And then over here in the course you'll find the assignments. Uh, there will be a Homework 2 that will pop up similar to that so you will just uh, browse my computer and attach the file that you know you you noted the location that you put that and then you upload the file that you created it's that PDF and so that's all you'll have to do so in about 90 seconds we went from having a paper to having a PDF and um, it, it gives you some options on the phone for cropping out like if I took a picture of the paper and the table, it's pretty intelligent about detecting the boundary between the two. And if you were taking a picture from an angle, then obviously its view of the picture is going to be keystoned and skewed, and it can automatically correct for that as well. Uh, but the thing I'll ask is, uh, please have it upload black and white. Don't do color or grayscale. It's just the PDFs are a lot more sharp and easier for the grader to look at if it's black and white. So. Just to summarize, I think cam scanner is a good way to do it, but I don't necessarily insist that it's that. It can be any way you want to create a PDF, but it does have to be electronic submissions for the homeworks. So any questions about that process? All right. Um, homework, lectures next week are online. You can come to class next week and maybe watch the videos here in the room if, if you're really a creature of habit. But I won't be here, and most of your classmates won't be here. So the videos are already available online. And uh, I'll also, just so that you don't have to find them on YouTube, I'll post links, specific links for lectures three and four on MU Online, if, if you didn't want to just click this video to get it. So uh, today's topic for our lecture is uh, fluid viscosity and gas laws. So are there any questions about the announcements before we get into the new material? All right. What is this a picture of? Let's analyze some images here. It's honey. How do you know that's honey? Okay, so there's a spoon. What's the other thing? 
It's coming out slow. It is coming out slow, but how do we know it's coming out slow? Like, what's the, the visual clue? It's cohesive. It's, what did you say? It's got necking in the middle, so it's tapering down as the fluid accelerates. What, was there a comment here? The bubbles are elongated. Why are there bubbles? How come we can see bubbles? That's entrained air. They're trapped. The air bubbles are trapped. Um, if this was water with yellow food coloring, we probably wouldn't see these bubbles because the bubbles would just float to the surface. Why aren't the bubbles just floating to the surface here? There's a resistance to movement. So we're going to be talking about viscosity today. Let's begin by watching a little video clip here that illustrates two different fluids that appear similar but actually are different. They're both clear. And in fact, they both have about the same density, but when that guy shook it, the one on the left shook easily. This is the water. You can see it pours easily. And this looks like some thick, rich water. Quench your thirst with that, right? That's actually glycerin. You wouldn't want to quench your thirst with glycerin. It's an ingredient in soap and other personal care products, but it has a very high viscosity. About the same density, though. It looks the same. It's both clear. And so um, viscosity. What is this viscosity? So let's begin by talking about strain. Anybody remember what strain is? The deformation of a physical body under the action of applied forces. And so. Um, a solid, if you have a, uh, a shear stress that you apply to a solid, then it's going to deform. And so the strain is that deformation. So I have a metal ruler here. I'm going to apply a stress, and then it's going to strain under the stress that I applied. So just by pushing on the ends, you can see that the ruler deforms. Now, it's still deformed right now, and I'm still pushing on it. So one of the differences between a solid and a liquid is that in the case of a solid, the, uh, the deformation ceases when you reach equilibrium. Like, it's not continuing to change shape. It, it comes into an equilibrium of, I was pressing on the ends and it was pressing back, but there is a proportionality there. In the case of a liquid, um, when you apply a shear stress, there is a factor that relates the stress and the strain. And that proportionality factor is the viscosity. Whereas in the case of a solid, shear modulus is how we talk about how much deformation there is going to be when you apply a force. Now this, is, uh, this ruler is steel. If it was made out of titanium, it would deform less. Because titanium is a stronger metal, it has a higher shear modulus. In the case of liquids, what we saw was uh, that first bottle that was being shaken of the water. There was lots of deformation for the forces that were being applied. But when that person shook the container, the same amount was applying the same force to the outside uh, container, that glass, then the, uh, the glycerin was deforming less because it had a higher viscosity. So qualitatively, that's kind of the, uh, the relationship between shear modulus and viscosity. There's an analogy there. So what are the implications of fluid uh, viscosity? Um, one of them has to be how uh, water responds in natural environments like in a river or a channel. This is a very picturesque view of a scene in nature. And um, let's say the water is moving downstream and um, the velocity of the water. Where is the velocity of the water faster? At the top of the stream or at the bottom of the stream? Why would you think the top? Because what? The wind has more effect. Let's say it's not a windy day. You're right. But if it's just a calm day, what? I heard somebody say resistance. You're right. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean? That's right. So at the bottom, it's touching, it may be sand, it may be cobblestones, but the water at the bottom of the river is touching some solid object that's stationary. So 
Here is a diagram that's a velocity profile. This is, let's just assume, that river. And at the bottom of the river, the velocity is essentially, the velocity of the liquid is the same as the velocity of the solid. Those two substances are in contact with each other, and there's something we call the no-slip condition. And it is that the liquid can't slip frictionlessly over some stationary object, that there is going to be a relationship between the motionless solid and in the vicinity very, very close to that solid, the liquid will have the same velocity. But as you get further and further away from the bottom of the river, the velocity is increasing. Okay, so this dy dv is just saying for some distance away, the velocity is getting faster and faster. And you'll notice that this is nonlinear. That at first, when you get maybe a centimeter away from the bottom, it increased the velocity a little. But the further away you get, the incremental changes in uh, velocity are, uh, well actually, the velocity is increasing fastest, the dv is increasing fastest, closest to the, to the boundary there. Here's a physical demonstration of that no-slip condition that I mentioned briefly before. So let me give you some background here. All right, this is a straw and they're going to be injecting a water-soluble dye. Uh, what you don't notice yet is that there is a stream of water flowing from the right towards the left. We're looking at this, uh, remember in the lab, I pointed out the flume in the back, of the back of the lab was that big plastic channel. This is happening in a flume. They've got this straw that they're going to be injecting a dye into. And they're going to uh, start injecting the dye, and you'll see some swirling of the dye in the liquid. And then they're going to put it down at the bottom of the container. And it'll be interesting to see the difference between when they're injecting the dye into the bulk of the fluid, and then when they're injecting the dye down at that interface of the liquid and the solid. Okay, so they're turning on the dye. And you can see that up here in the bulk, it's just streaming easily, but then down here at the bottom, the dye is stuck. And it's not because it's a uh, sticky dye. They demonstrate here it's still just water soluble, but it's because of the no-slip condition. So let me rewind that. So they injected some of it down at the bottom, and the, the liquid velocity is zero. And so the liquid isn't moving because it's in contact with the solid. And the reason why it's not moving is because the fluid has viscosity. Any questions about that video? All right, so some definitions. Uh, we can think of viscosity as being resistance to flow. And so a fluid with lots of viscosity is going to exhibit lots of resistance to flowing from place to place. And so oil, for instance, has a higher viscosity than water does. And if you've ever changed your oil before, um, what's the, the temperature dependency of viscosity? The warmer it is, it flows a lot easier. That's exactly right. So if you change your oil on a cold day without warming up the engine first, it's going to be dripping out of the oil pan for hours, maybe. You know, if you're really a, a picky kind of guy and you want to get every last dirty drop of the old oil out of there, it's going to take a long time. But if you warm it up, or if it's a warm day, then it flows much more easily. There's a, a temperature <coughs> dependency on viscosity. Um, here, the, the, the variables that we're using, we're going to say V is velocity, uh, y is the distance from the solid surface, so from the bottom of the river. And then the ratio of those two, dy, dv, we'll call that the rate of strain. Um, viscosity is the proportionality factor. If we remember the idea of shear stress, which is the force applied per unit area, then it's viscosity that relates the rate of strain and the shear stress. And so in other words, if you're applying some force, how much does it move? 
In the case of the glycerin, the force that was being applied was maybe turning the, uh, um, turning the glass beaker over, and it moved very slowly because it had a different viscosity. It had a higher viscosity than the water, which moved more easily for the same shear stress that was applied. Oh, we already watched that video. All right. Now let's compare um, liquids and gases. Think about uh, walking through a swimming pool. Like, you know, if you go to the pool and it's just up to your chest, how quickly can you move through water? Very slow. It's, it's easier to walk through air than it is to walk through water. Why is that? Why is it easier to walk quickly through air than it is to walk through water? Oh. Fluid friction, differences in viscosity. Air has a lower viscosity, actually. And so remember that viscosity is resistance to flow. So think about walking through a swimming pool. The water has to get out of your way before you can move forward. Like right now, as I'm walking through the classroom, the air is getting out of the way really easily with very little effort. Now, if I was going faster, you know, vehicles that are going on the freeway, 75, 85 miles an hour, um, there's a significant force when you're moving that quickly. But the reason for differences in the force required to move through a fluid is because in the case there's less friction in the air and if you think about it in terms of the rate of deformation air moves out of the way more quickly if you apply the same shear stress to it water is going to move more slowly now again here is shear stress viscosity and rate of strain so dv dy is the rate of strain um, let's think about the difference between air and water. And uh, graphically, what is this viscosity? So shear stress, the units of that would be newtons per meter squared. It's the force per unit area. And so let's think just to begin with in terms of force. If you apply a certain amount of force, what this figure is saying is that the oil is not going to deform very much. But water, would deform more for the same amount of force. And so that's kind of consistent with what we know, that those fluids with a lot of viscosity are going to be the ones that move out of the way more sluggishly. But then air, on the other case, uh, you're going to have a lot of deformation for the same shear stress that's applied. So if the shear stress that, uh, that's applied is the force of my leg muscles as I walk, then I get a lot of deformation of air and very, a lot less deformation of water. And the slope of these lines is the viscosity. And so the slope that this is talking about, the, uh, the vertical component of that slope is the shear stress. And then the horizontal component of that slope, here they're saying du dy, but you've already seen that sometimes for velocity they're using the variable u, sometimes they're using the letter v. Um, so here du dy is the same thing as dv dy. It's just a matter of uh, notation differences. So the slope of that line is viscosity. Any questions so far? So graphically, we can think of it as the slope that relates shear stress and rate of strain. Or we can just think of it quantitatively as the, the ratio between those two things you know, in terms of the equation here. Kinematic viscosity is related to the absolute viscosity. Um, a lot of equations that you're going to be solving this semester use both viscosity and density in the same equation. And so what kinematic vis viscosity does is it, it relates the viscosity as a function of a fluid density. So it's both. Um, so here is kinematic viscosity. It's the absolute viscosity divided by the density. 
And so if we look at the units of absolute viscosity is newton seconds per meter squared, and the units of density is kilograms per cubic meter. Um, by the way, of course, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, and so there's a, a mass unit built into the newtons. If we cancel out all the common units, then what we're left with for kinematic viscosity is meter squared per second. For water, which is the fluid that we will work with most often, the typical kind of like if you're given no other value for viscosity, for water, it's 1 times 10 to the minus third newton seconds per meter squared. And for kinematic viscosity then, it would be this divided by 1,000. So it's 1 times 10 to the minus sixth meter squared per second. Those are just kind of like the typical ballpark values for water. But you can look up those in the fluid properties. The viscosity does uh, change as a function of temperature. And so typically when you have homework problems, it'll tell you the temperature of the fluid. And so you should go and look up the temperature out of the table. Now, a word about, um, a couple words here about the terminology. And so viscosity, absolute viscosity, and dynamic viscosity, those all mean the same thing. Those terms are, you can be thought of as interchangeable. And uh, I'll usually just call it viscosity. Um, your text calls it sometimes viscosity, sometimes absolute. And then there are different books that sometimes call it dynamic viscosity. So those three terms mean the same thing, mu which has units of newton seconds per meter squared. But kinematic viscosity is where you take that and divide it by the density of the fluid. OK, so shear stress, if we go back to here. Shear stress is the viscosity of the fluid multiplied by the rate of strain. Shear force is if we multiply the shear stress by an area. So here, force is shear stress multiplied by area. And force is going to have units of newtons. Remember, the shear stress had units of newtons per square meter. So then if we multiply that by meters, then it'll just be units of newtons. So here's the equation. And we'll use uh, force is viscosity times area times rate of strain. We'll use that a lot for problem solving, including on an example that's here on this slide in just a moment. Um, and this is just kind of a, a proof that the units of force should be newtons based on that we have the viscosity, newton seconds per meter squared, area of meter squared, the velocity, du, the change in velocity, is going to have units of meters per second. The uh, change in distance is going to be meters. And so when all of that cancels out, all that's left is newtons. Now, um, du dy is sometimes, if we assume a linear distribution in change in velocity with respect to distance, we'll just have that be some velocity and some distance, rather than taking the, uh, the differential of that. And so let me show you what I mean when we assume a linear uh, velocity distribution. Let's say that we have a tank full of some liquid. And the liquid is glycerin, which was that second fluid that was in the video. It's the more viscous fluid than water. We've got a metal plate that we want to pull through that liquid. And so we're going to have to apply a force in order to get it to move. And the reason why is that, remember, the no-slip condition says that you can't have a solid move in contact with a fluid and have no frictional resistance there. Any fluid that has viscosity, a force is going to have to be applied to overcome the frictional resistance. And so what we'd like to do here is calculate. Now let's say that the uh, dimensions of the plate is 3 meters by 2 meters. So maybe it's 3 meters long and then 2 meters into the page, although we can't see that dimension from this side view. In other words, 
In other words, the area is uh, three by two. Now, we're moving it through the glycerin, and uh, I've provided here the viscosity for the glycerin, 0.15 newton seconds per meter squared. And we want to achieve a velocity of 0.58 meters per second. Now, it gives you the dimensions to uh, the top of the tank and the bottom of the tank. And the reason why is that you're going to need to have a, di a distance uh, to put into the dy here. And it's actually, um, if you had a really small distance, I think you can probably grasp this um, just based on your experiences in the world. Think about if you had a very narrow um, channel and you're trying to pull this plate through a very narrow channel. As you pull it, it's going to be a really small gap for the fluid to get out of the way. And so you'd have to apply a big force to pull that plate through a narrow gap. But in this case, since you've got more space for the fluid to move around the plate as you pull it, then there's going to be less force required. And so um, what I'd like you to do in this example is calculate the total force. And I'll give you a hint that there's actually two components. There's the force on the top of the plate and the force on the bottom of the plate. So what you'll need to do what you'll need to do is uh, calculate the force top and the force bottom using this formula. So the formula that you're going to use is, it is the viscosity, the area, and then du, dy. And what we, what we said earlier is that dy, du, dy is sometimes simplified just to be velocity divided by distance. All right, now I don't want to say too much more because then it would take away your opportunity to figure it out on your own. But I'm going to pause the recording. Feel free to uh, discuss it and collaborate with your classmates here and try and find out what's the overall total force that we're going to have to apply to be able to get that plate to move through the glycerin. All right, so if we just break the problem down into what givens we already have, uh, here's our equation that relates viscosity, area, and rate of strain to force, which we're trying to calculate. The given dimensions allow us to know that it's a six meter area on the top and six meter area on the bottom. So there's actually two surfaces that are going to be uh, experiencing um, an interaction with the fluid. <coughs> the top shear force and the bottom shear force. All right, uh, so then we just basically have to substitute in the velo uh, viscosity area and then the rate of strain here. It's going to be the same, visco the same velocity but a different distance between uh, the top and the bottom. So it's 1.2 meters up to the top, 2.4 meters to the bottom. So in the end, as I was walking around, it seems like uh, most people were getting 0.65 newtons. That's right. Any questions about this example? Yes? Because it's very thin. If we were given a thickness of the plate, then that's something that we'd have to uh, be aware of. Good question. Thank you. All right, so you have a homework problem. This is one of my favorite all-time fluid mechanics uh, homework problems of all time for the whole semester. I love this problem. Uh, if I didn't give you these hints, you may not love it as much as I do. But I hope that with these hints, you're going to love it as much as I do. All right, so here's what we've got. We've got an outer pipe that's housing this cylinder that's falling down through the pipe. And the, uh, the pipe is, the outside of the uh, cylinder is lubricated with an oil film. So. One thing you're going to have to be aware of is remember the, uh, the formulas for, for example, uh, area as a function of diameter. 
Anybody know what, how, how to calculate area as a function of diameter? Yeah, you know pi r squared, that comes to the tip of your tongue, but uh, diameter is a parameter that you're going to have a lot more often than radius in fluid mechanics and hydraulics. Pi d squared divided by 4. Yeah, so that's how you calculate the area. Um, now, how would you calculate the volume of a cylinder? Yeah, just multiply that by whatever length we've got. And so volume would be length times area. Now, one thing that actually ends up being pretty important, though, is the outside area of the cylinder. So not the cross-sectional area of that face, but the oil is in contact with the outside area of the cylinder. The oil isn't, what we're not interested in isn't the oil in contact with that circular top or bottom, but it's the outside edge of the cylinder. And so, what's the area there? How do you cal calculate the outside area of the cylinder? Circumference. circumference, good. So that'll give you this distance and then times the length. Right, so circumference is what? Pi D, right? So circumference is pi D. And so the area of the cylinder, the outside area, would be uh, pi d l. All right, so a little bit of geometry reminder there. So here's what we've got. We know the weight of the cylinder is 15 newtons. The diameter of the pipe and the diameter of the cylinder. So how big is this gap? Trick question. We've got a pipe, and we've got a cylinder falling downward through the pipe. The pipe is 100.5 millimeters, and the cylinder is 100 millimeters. Yeah, so this difference of 0.5 is evenly distributed on both sides. So assume it's falling straight in the middle of the pipe. So that means this gap distance here is 0.25 millimeters, uh, here's another 0.25 millimeters. I really encourage you to do as many sketches as you can think of in your homework assignments. It's always going to be a valuable investment of time to just do a little drawing because visualizing that problem before you start the number crunching will it'll really help you to avoid uh, making mistakes. And this is an illustration of that. Pardon? Okay, yeah, it's, it's 0.25. So, um, what we need to do here is, uh, it says derive the formula for a steady rate of descent. descent. So, what that, that maybe sounds a little fancy. Anytime, I hated it in math when they said derive. I mean, that's, oh, I'm going to fall asleep if he derives another equation, you know? Derive. So, what it really means is, Essentially, what I want you to do is find the equilibrium velocity. So how fast is this cylinder going to fall down through the pipe? For the oil that we're talking about, for the gap distance, for the given weight, equilibrium. I've underlined equilibrium. What does equilibrium mean? Terminal velocity, it's not accelerating. It means a balance in forces. So vertically speaking, there's the weight of the cylinder acting down. That's one force. What's the other force that is going to cause equilibrium? The oil pushing on the face of the cylinder. What direction is the oil going to be pushing? Up. It's resisting movement. So if the motion is down, the, uh, the shear force is opposing that motion. So the, so the uh, the shear force is up, and so, in other words, the two forces are equal. We're going to have a shear force up of 15 newtons and the cylinder weight down of 15 newtons in equilibrium. So it's asking, you know, here's our equation, our shear force equation. In equilibrium, the shear force equals the weight of the cylinder. Area, how do we handle the area? the area of the cylinder. It's that outside area. All right. Viscosity. Where do you find out a bit visco about viscosity? 
this is SAE 20 weight at 10 degrees Celsius. Just so we're all on the same page, you can look that up out of the back of your book. Um, in fact, I think uh, there's a figure, and maybe if my memory serves correctly, the figure actually doesn't go all the way to 10 degrees Celsius, ironically. So uh, let's use 0.35 newton seconds per meter squared as the viscosity for that oil. So what you can do is, using the gap distance that we've talked about here from this view, using the outside area of the cylinder, you can solve for the velocity, du. That'll be the only unknown in this equation if you know the shear force, the area, the viscosity, and the uh, gap distance. du is the only unknown. Question? Yeah, why do we only use the outside area of, uh, of this? Because uh, what we know is that there's an oil film lubricating that gap distance, and it's the tight spaces that kind of govern. That's where the, uh, the big forces come from, the tight spaces. And so um, I guess it's not, we're not given that there's oil, like it's not falling through oil necessarily. It's just that there's a thin film on the outside wall. Like maybe someone coated the outside wall with the oil, and so it's falling down through that. So the other answer would be that you know, that's where the space is the smallest. And it's the small spaces that always cause the high forces. Good question. Thanks. Yeah? Good question. Yeah. Um, sometimes in this problem, students will say, well, Here's one, and there's another one. So are there two gaps? But it's one continuous gap all the way around the cylinder. So yes, you'll just use that single gap distance for dy. All right, so now this problem hopefully will be uh, pretty easy for you to solve. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Um, you know, this chapter two in the textbook, by the way, I, if you haven't got the textbook yet, I really hope that it's coming soon. Uh, it's, it's great to review the textbook after the lectures and even before them. Um, so chapter two is where we're at right now, fluid properties. And one of the properties of viscosity is that it's independent of the pressure of the liquid. And so you can have oil under a lot of pressure, such as in an engine, where they're having to force the oil under pressure so that it gets in those little cracks in the, uh, uh, between the pistons and the cylinders. Um, the viscosity doesn't change if the fluid is pressurized, if it's a liquid. Um, and the viscosity arises because of intermolecular forces. Uh, in the case of a liquid, what's interesting is that when you increase the temperature, you decrease the, the viscosity. So those cohesive forces uh, get less as the temperature increases. Remember, the hot oil empties out of the engine more quickly and more easily because it's less viscous when it's warm. But the interesting thing is that gases have the opposite effect. As you heat a gas, because the little molecules are bouncing around and there are more collisions and there's more molecular activity, Actually, that ends up increasing the viscosity, although the effect is a little bit, uh, it's, it's kind of slight. Uh, let me jump over this for just a moment to show you a figure of those temperature effects. So here's a figure that shows decreasing viscosity for a liquid, in this case crude oil, de decreasing viscosity as a function of temperature, but then air is increasing with increasing temperature. So we can see those effects in the figures that are in the appendix, that temperature dependency. This happened to be kinematic viscosity, but it's the same kind of curve for absolute viscosity. It's just that uh, in this case of kinematic, it's been normalized relative to the density of the fluid. Okay, let me jump back to that slide that I was just on a moment ago here, Sutherland's equation. Um, the purpose of Sutherland's equation is to allow you to estimate the viscosity of a gas. 
at temperatures other than what you may have data for. You know, if you've got a table that says what the viscosity is at one temperature, but your problem is at another, Sutherland's equation will allow you to find out what viscosity you should use for the temperature in question. Um, and it relies on a Sutherland's constant that you can look up for gases. It's dependent on which gas is in question. For air, Sutherland's constant is 111 Kelvin. Um, and uh, just so you get a chance to try out Sutherland's equation, since you've got a homework problem on it, let's try one of these problems now in class as an example. And then I think you'll be fully ready for the one that shows up in your homework assignment. So here, let's say we're working with air at 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, we can look up the viscosity of air at 50, and it's 1.95 times 10 to the minus fifth Newton seconds per meter squared. But we want to know the viscosity at 95 degrees Celsius. So at the given temperature, our T naught is 50, and our viscosity naught is this 1.95. Let's use Sutherland's constant and Sutherland's equation to find out what is the viscosity at uh, 95. Now you'll notice Sutherland's constant is in Kelvin. So what do you think that means about uh, the temperatures that we should put in here? Yeah, let's convert it to Kelvin because uh, otherwise things won't cancel out and add together the way that they need to. So um, change your temperatures to Kelvin and then calculate the viscosity at 95. All right, so uh, this is just one of those easy substitute into the equation type problems here. Um, if we have a starting viscosity at 50 Celsius of 1.95, then Sutherland's equation allows us to estimate what the viscosity would be at some other temperature. Uh, if you did the calculations, got 2.15 times 10 to the minus fifth. That's right. Uh, if we go to the back of the book, Table A3 has that actual viscosity at 95, and it's exactly what Sutherland's would predict. Now, the one that's in the table is a measured viscosity. They actually found that experimentally. Sutherland's equation is just an extrapolation, and in this case, it extrapolated just fine. So you've got a homework problem related to this. I think you'll be able to knock that one out pretty easily as well. Any questions on this example? All right. Some other interesting stuff related to viscosity is the idea of Newtonian versus non-Newtonian fluids. Um, a Newtonian fluid is something where the shear stress is proportional to shear strain, meaning that viscosity doesn't change when you apply a force. Um, there are fluids, though, where they are what's called shear thinning. And so what that means is that the viscosity changes when you begin to apply a force. Actually, when you apply a stress or a force to this shear thinning fluid, it actually it has a decrease in its viscosity. And so uh, toothpaste, ketchup, paint, things that have uh, suspended particles, usually uh, once you start applying the stress, then the viscosity decreases in them. So for, for instance, think about a, a glass ketchup bottle. And if you've turned it upside down, nothing's coming out, right? So you start shaking it. Part of what happens when you're shaking that ketchup bottle 
is, uh, you know, you're providing a force to dislodge it, but also the viscosity decreases when you start shaking the ketchup bottle. Uh, we'll look at some video clips in just a minute of uh, non-Newtonian fluids. On the other side of the non-Newtonian fluid, opposite from shear thinning, is a shear thickening fluid. Now, a shear thickening fluid is something where the fluid has a response to the force being applied of actually having increased viscosity. So it becomes thicker if we think of viscosity as being thickness. That's kind of like a non-quantitative way to describe viscosity, but I think you know what it means. Shear thickening is it becomes more viscous as the force is applied. So here's a figure that shows what we mean. A Newtonian fluid, like water, it has no change in viscosity as the uh, shear stress is applied. So this line here is the proportionality constant, so it's linear, meaning that viscosity is the same when you apply shear stress and uh, experience a shear strain. But a shear thinning fluid, you see that this, the slope of this is decreasing as you apply the force. And so it's becoming less viscous as you apply some force and a shear thickening is more viscous. Well, let's take a look at this video clip. <laughs> this is cornstarch in water. If you walk quickly, <laughs> you can stand over. on top it's of all it. Over. He's going down. It's but not if you work. <laughs> oh, it's eating you. He spent his 15th birthday in that uh, cornstarch. <laughs> All right. So that is a uh, shear thickening fluid. So what was happening there is if you apply more force, it has more viscosity. So if, if you walk quickly across it, it's going to be nice and viscous. It can support the weight of your foot. But if you slow down, you're not applying as much force to it. Then, it shear, then, then the viscosity is low. So if we go back to this slide here, uh, that is uh, a mixture of gypsum water, or in this case, cornstarch and water is shear thickening. Here's another kind of interesting clip. Oh, now I'm hungry. All right, ready? Yeah, ready? This is basically the same stuff. This is cornstarch and water. They've added a food coloring just to make it uh, more contrast. And then this is a subwoofer, which is going to, it's going to be vibrating and providing the force. Go for it. Like once you set it off, it's like, oh, there you go. And then it just collapses back. Here's some of the slow motion. They were using a high-speed camera to capture the vibrations and how the fluid is responding into those vibrations. It almost looks animated, right? It's not. All right, so now we're all going to go home and ruin our stereos. Shear thickening fluid. I, I haven't yet found a, a really good video that illustrates shear thinning. I'm sure there's one out there, a catch-up explosion or something. If you happen across one, let me know. All right, so uh, a word about your textbook. It's where you can find fluid properties. You'll have homework problems that ask you to use the viscosity of water at a certain temperature, or they'll talk about a change in viscosity for a certain fluid. Well, all of that information is in the appendix. Here's table A5 that illustrates the fluid properties for water. There's another table for 
uh, alcohol, mercury, seawater, oils. And this is just showing a single viscosity at a given temperature. The point is, all the mechanical properties that you need for the homework problems are in the appendix of the textbook. All right, let's uh, cover one more topic today. And that is uh, the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. You'll never forget that, right? You'll remember that forever. All right, so when we have that ideal gas law, it's for a universal gas constant, meaning um, some typical gas. A pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles of uh, gas, where we're using Avogadro's number there, 6 times 10 to the 23rd. The universal gas constant, we have a variety of units that are available depending on the units of the other stuff in the problem, and then absolute temperature. We can rearrange the ideal gas law uh, to solve for pressure, and um, if we um, use the molecular weight of the gas in the numerator and the denominator, the point of doing that is that then we can look up the gas constant for a specific gas. Not, not just the universal gas constant, but you know, each gas, whether it's air, helium, nitrogen, uh, oxygen, uh, there is a, a gas constant for that specific gas or mixture of gases that we can use in problem solving. And so this is a lot simpler for us to use if we want to find the pressure of a gas based on its density the R value, the gas constant that's specific for that fluid, and then the temperature in absolute terms. So this density came from the number of moles, the molecular weight of the gas, and then the volume. So the number of moles multiplied by the molecular weight is a mass. So that's the kilograms of gas per volume, which is density. Mass per unit volume. All right. So... We can use this problem for solving, uh, we can use this equation for solving problems like what is the density, the specific gravity, and the mass of air in a room with dimensions 4 by 5 by 6. So roughly, I mean, this room is approximately within the same ballpark of those dimensions. So in this room right now, what we're trying to find out is if we had a certain temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, it's probably, that's a little warmer than it is in here right now. But if we had a room that size with 25 Celsius air, and you can look up in the table, in the back of the book, the physical property of gases. Here's the R value specifically for air, 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And um, let me just write on the board, if you were going to... Um, expand out the units there of joules per kilogram Kelvin that's given. Um, 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin is the same as 287 Newton meters per kilogram Kelvin. Because a joule is a Newton meter. And, of course, we know that a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, right? So that's 287 kilogram meter per second squared. But then we still also have that other meter kilogram Kelvin. And now we can start canceling things out. Uh, so kilograms is in the numerator and the denominator. We've got meter squared and so on. So this 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin is the same as 287 meter squared per second squared Kelvin. And so this is the R value we're going to use in this formula for density. So what I'd like you to do is I'm going to give you a moment to calculate density, specific gravity, and mass. Specific gravity. Does anybody remember the formula for specific gravity that we covered in class last time? SG is what? Right, so it's the density of something divided by the density of water. Or it's the unit weight of something divided by the unit weight of water. Okay, so in this case, 
our, uh, our fluid is gas, and so we want to know the density, specific gravity, and then mass in the air for the volume that's given, the temperature that's given, and the pressure in question. Okay, so uh, some of the preliminary stuff that we had to do was change the temperature over from Celsius to Kelvin. So 25 Celsius becomes 298.16 Kelvin. And then pressure of 100 kPa, as I've written on the board here, 100 kPa is the same as 100,000 newtons per meter squared. And then if we want to break down that newtons into its base units, just so that we see all the units are going to cancel in the formula for density, then that becomes 100,000 kilograms per second squared meter. And then the R value, we already went through that R value. It's 287 meters squared per second squared Kelvin. So if you substitute it all into the formula for density, then the density of the gas will be 1.169 kilograms per cubic meter. By the way, let me give you uh, a hint that I think will really serve you well. Um, always write the units in every step of a problem. Uh, don't wait to the end to write the units. Write the units in every step. And the reason why is what if I hadn't written the units and I just started substituting in the numbers? then maybe I would have said the density is 100 divided by the R value 287 times the temperature which is 25. So obviously this is wrong for a couple of different reasons because I didn't convert the pressure from kilopascals into pascals. You know, here I didn't convert the temperature from Celsius to Kelvin. But if you write the units in every step, then you're going to see clues that maybe you've made a mistake if the units themselves don't start canceling out and turn uh, ultimately into the units that you need for the solution. So it's a really good habit to write your units not just at the end, but every step of the uh, problem. And this semester, every example I show you, I'm going to follow that because um, I'm going to try and practice what I preach. I'm going to write the units for every step of the uh, example um, on the board or in the PDF. Okay, so the density. Um, now, the specific gravity is going to be the ratio of the fluid density relative to water. Let me zoom in a bit so that's easier to see. Okay, so the, the specific gravity is going to be the density of the air divided by the density of water. And we just use the typical water density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So that gives us 0 0.001169 for the specific gravity. And then mass. Um, if density is the mass per unit volume, you can find the mass by multiplying the density by the volume. And that's what we do here, is multiply the volume of the room by the density of the gas. And that means there's 140.3 kilograms of air in the room. All right. So just as a reminder, uh, this lecture is recorded. If you need to come back to these examples, you know, if I scroll through something faster than you were able to write it down, uh, the examples are included in the video. Of course, if you've got any questions, you can come see me during my office hours or send me an email and I'll try and respond. Reminder that we are not meeting in person next week. Um, so if you have any questions about the homework, I'd encourage you to start early and, uh, you know, 
There's no reason why you couldn't solve the entire assignment this afternoon if you wanted to really get after it early. So I'll see you on September 5th. Tuesday, September 5th is when we'll be back to our normal class meetings. That's a week from Tuesday. Take care.